a leader, oh good, we agree, uh, of one of the design firms in Seattle that was really well known, not only for the caliber of its work, but the caliber of its people. And your, your agency, the Lenhart Group, uh, spun off so many great firms and freelancers. And some of you may be familiar with turnstile design because I'm guessing somebody here probably had a class from, uh, help me. Ben? Not Ben. Matt? Is there? <laughs> Steve Watson? No, although Steve, they've all taught here. No, who am I yeah. thinking of who, who taught the visual design for UX? Andy, Andy oh. Stewart. So anyway, it's a great firm. And uh, those guys all met and first worked together at uh, the Lenhart Group. So I'll let you tell your story, but I think the, the, the key to this is simply that Ted has been on the receiving end as well as the delivery end of so many negotiations over the year that uh, he's really developed a pretty impressive expertise in how to go about asking for money, something I imagine we would all agree we're horrible at. And that's because you're creative people and there's this almost one-to-one -one relationship, which if you chose a creative pursuit for a career, you're probably not the kind of person who's comfortable talking about money. So with that, Ted, thank you so much for joining us and I will hand this off to you. Thank you. Cool, all right. Uh, so I, uh, today I work with creative all over the world actually, thanks to Zoom, et cetera. And I help them with negotiation issues of all kinds, um, salaries, gigs, fees for gigs, selling the business, negotiating the buying of another business. I typically have about 10 clients at a time. I think I have like 12 clients right now. Um, and they're both individuals and small firms. My biggest client employs, I think, 100 people. Um, and that's pretty big for a design firm these days. Um, so I'm actively involved in helping clients deal with issues and then all kinds of other management issues and stuff like that come my way. Um, a little background, I did not, I was a terrible negotiator. I'm probably still a terrible negotiator. I didn't study negotiation until long into my career. And it was because I realized kind of out of the blue that I was, me and my staff were dealing with professional negotiators every day when we were, when we were negotiating gigs. Um, and then I sold my business and I went to work for the people basically that bought, that bought the business. And I had responsibility theoretically for 500 creative people, which is of course ridiculous. But in the process of having this creative director role, uh, I met creatives from all over the world in these small offices that had been bought up by the same company that bought us up. And, uh, and I found that everybody's, I mean, maybe not everybody, but most creatives struggle with negotiations just the way I did. And so when I left Europe and I came back to the States, I, I did some negotiating, I did some consulting with a couple of large clients, helping them buy design offices. So again, a negotiation focus. And I was felt like I was on the wrong side of the table. I, you know, it's like, these were like my people and I'm buying them for the evil empire or something. And so one of those guys fired me and I quit the other one. And, um, and I began writing and you know, studying negotiations. I got some training myself. I began writing about it. I began writing articles and putting them in various journals, ended up with a writing gig for, for a fast company for a while. Um, and then I wrote a little book, which was basically assembled articles called Nail It. And by the way, I would encourage, it's only five bucks on my site, or you can get it from Amazon for more than that, I think. Um, and it's nothing but stories that are, you know, fictionalized stories of real negotiations that my clients have gone through. Um, and a lot of people have given me good feedback on it. Um, so it's, and it's, it's all done in story form. Anyway, 
All right, so here I am now, you know, having been basically doing this since doing this negotiation consulting since 2003. So I have as long a career as a trainer, et cetera, as I do as a designer almost. Um, anyway, by the way, interrupt me all any time through this. If you have a question, don't understand something or want to interject an experience that you've had as, as I've gone through, as I'm going through this, just please, please do that. Um, I welcome your, your input, your comments, your struggles, your successes, whatever. Uh, also, um, I will put my notes for this talk, which includes things to say when you're in difficult circumstances uh, in the chat at the end, so you can all get it if you want it. Um, I, I put together, I didn't put together a PowerPoint, I just put together my notes and figured I'd talk. I found that work seems to work better on Zoom. I hate doing Zoom when I'm looking at a screen with some PowerPoint slide or some keynote slide that I created. I'd much rather look at your faces. Um, so I'm gonna, I broke this into three broad areas. The first is emotions are our creative vulnerability and how to deal with that. Um, and by the way, I still, I mean, I'm 76. Yeah, I'm 76 years old. I still struggle with this myself. So it never goes away. As far as I can tell, it doesn't go away. Um, the, uh, broad area number two is control how to get control, how to prepare, what to do and say. So, you know, you can, you can win at this. You just have to, you have, you just have to think about it a little bit. And then number three, forces beyond us, trends and things that have impact on us. And by the way, I wanna mention that one of the forces that's going on right now is that the, the giant companies are hiring creatives like crazy, hiring UX, UI, and other creative positions like crazy salaries are up like 30, 40%. So that's, that's hugely in our favor. However, it's very difficult for small firms because they're losing their people to the Adobe's, the Microsoft's, uh, the Facebook's, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, anyway, so thought I would do first some stories. I have some stories to tell you. Stories of designers who negotiated well and negotiated badly. Um, Billy, I've changed the names obviously. Uh, Billy is a local guy and he was uh, negotiating a deal with one of our large tech companies here. He was terrified of the negotiation. Um, and, uh, and he, you know, wanted some help. And so we had like three or four sessions together in the process while he was talking to people within this giant corporation. And one of the conversations that he had was with a very senior, I think it was a vice presidential level guy at this company. And this VP called him when it was midnight where he was. So I don't remember where he was. He was in Europe somewhere or something. And he made an appointment to call my client when it was midnight on his end and a reasonable time on my client's end and was basically encouraging him to take the offer. And when that happened, I knew that, oh, guess what? <laughs> These guys are desperate to hire you, desperate for your skills. And, and then he was preparing for the final negotiation with an HR person. And this was all on a, you know, a video call, Zoom or something, probably Skype. And, uh, and it was with an HR person. And I said to Billy, I said, and Billy said, I can't, I'm afraid to ask for more money than what they're offering. And um, I said, well, okay, so let's not ask. Let's not ask for more money. Let's just tell her what your skills are. Now she's, she's an HR person and she do doesn't know what it means that you've been featured, your work's been featured in this publication and you've worked for this design agency and that design agency, both the top of the heap in the world at that moment. Um, and why don't you just 
ask her forgiveness or if she would be willing to um, uh, have you tell a little bit about your career and uh, just to kind of fill her in on why it's important for them. And he did. And she said, of course. And he walked her through his history and took about 15 minutes doing it. And she raised the offer by, I think it was $25,000. So he never asked for the money. He just walked her through and she was already prepared to give him that extra money. But if he hadn't found some way to ask for it that felt comfortable to him, it would have never worked. He wouldn't have gotten the money. And uh, by, by having him do something that he was comfortable doing, he got the money. So a little bit of an unusual negotiating technique, but one for someone who felt the way that he did at that time. Tell you another little story. Uh, Victor contacted me. He had just graduated college from a Southern University and he wanted to get a job with one of the design firms, one of the brand design firms in New York. He was right out of college. And he and I had both written for a couple of online design uh, publications. I think it was Design Taxi. I don't even know if that exists anymore. And so he knew me as a writer writing for the same publication that he'd contributed a couple articles to about branding. And I, uh, and oh, the other, the other factor here is he needed a green card. He was from Europe. He did not have, he had permission to go to college here, but he did not have permission to work here. And he needed a green card uh, to be able to get this New York job. And so I suggested that he approach the London offices that were the London firms that had offices in New York, because the London firms are very used to dealing with issues like green cards because they hire from people from all over the world, which is not true of the US firms, at least at that time. This isn't that long ago, probably five years ago. Um, and, um, and I suggested that he, uh, asked to interview the uh, creative directors in these design firms on their thoughts about the future of design given the transition that they were going through and use his credentials as a writer to get access to these firms and uh, not tell them that he was guaranteeing them that it was gonna get published, just telling them that he was interested in was gonna write this article and um, and if they asked, he can always say that he can, he's gonna put it on his blog. And so he got like, I think three interviews. He got two job offers through those interviews. And one of them was a, a London firm and uh, the firm promised to help him with his green card. Ultimately it didn't work in the United States. So they transferred him to the London office. And then it, there, uh, he worked in the London office for like six months. And then they transferred him to the Singapore office and <laughs> which he was there able to work there for a year or two. And then he left them and uh, went to another London based design firm in New York, which indeed did get him the right to work in the US. And now he's interviewing to uh, take a sales position with a uh, uh, one of the giant old famous US advertising agencies. Um, so the negotiation was basically writing an article gave him access where he wouldn't have before. So there really was no negotiation. He, he but he got access by this promise of uh, writing an article. And he did indeed write the articles and posted them on his blog, and I think one of them got picked up by somebody. Um, third story, uh, not as good a story. Angel approached me. She was a college professor um, in a small university in the South, and she uh, uh, had just had the horrible experience of 
having a job offer rescinded. So she was offered a job at a much more major university in the Northern US, I think it was in Chicago. And she visited them, they flew her up and she, um, uh, she spent a day or two with them in New York and she, um, and she uh, um, uh, loved the job opportunity, loved what she was gonna be doing. She was a single mother, she had one child. Uh, it seemed perfect for her. Uh, she flew back to her home city, thought about it over the weekend, and then uh, had a, couple, a whole bunch of things came to mind and about the of questions that she had and help that she would like. And instead of calling her the primary contact, she sent them an email with 10 things that she was interested in finding out more about. And they rescinded the job offer. They rescinded the job offer. If she had um, not sent an email, if she had simply called the person that was her prime contact and said, hey, Bob, I've, I love the idea of working for you guys. I have some questions and some issues I'd like to air with you and uh, get your feedback. She could have adjusted her tone. She could have adjusted her, her uh, demeanor. She could, have, she could have changed her questions, but she didn't. She sent an email instead and they rescinded the job offer. Now, in all of my consulting, when someone's in final negotiations for a gig, never before, that's the only time that I've ever worked with anyone who actually had a job offer taken away. And I know it's a fear. I hear it all the time. Um, I'm afraid if I'm too aggressive, if I ask for too much money, they'll think I'm greedy or they'll think I'm not a team player or whatever. Um, they'll take the job away. Well, that's never happened except in this one case. And it's a great reason why you should never negotiate through email or text. You should always do it face-to-face -face in the best way that you can, in person being best, of course, and uh, on Zoom or whatever being second best. So uh, my second, my, my final little quickie story here is um, a guy in Washington, D.C. who was working in public relations who um, went in, uh, was given a, uh, uh, was offered a job in a larger firm in D.C. and he went in to do the interview and he was, uh, they uh, offered him uh, the salary and he was thrilled with it. And then after they offered him the salary, they asked him what he had been paid in his previous position. And instead of saying, um, that's a private matter between myself and my former employer, which is what I always encourage people to say, he told them what his salary had been, and it was considerably lower than this offer, and they dropped the offer by $5,000 on the spot. He said he could barely get out of the room without the tears flowing. It was, it was sort of like a sucker punch to the gut. Um, um, and uh, anyway, he recovered from that and went on and, and did indeed get a better job and negotiated a better salary with another firm. But, but it's a good reason why you should never reveal what your past pay is to, a, uh, to someone that you're negotiating a first time job with or any, any time. Okay, those little warm up stories. So emotions, why are creative people, me included, terrible at negotiating? And it's simple really, we love doing the work. We get tremendous pleasure from doing the work. You've probably heard of the book, The Flow, or maybe you haven't, it was written in the 90s. Um, and basically it, the book made the point that creative people are, have the longest periods of happiness of all of us. And the reason is that we, when we're engaged in our work, time goes away, um, uh, 
we 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 are so absorbed that we um, forget things, et cetera, et cetera, um, and we're kind of in the flow and the pleasure of doing the work. And uh, but when we're negotiating, what I have seen creatives do so often is um, roll over or give in or just not ask for what they deserve because they want to get back to that good feeling of doing the work. Um, asking for money is risky. You, they might say no. <laughs> um, and so we don't know how it's going to, how it's going to come out. And, and so we have this huge feeling of discomfort and we pull over, give in just, or just don't ask. And, and, it's, and I think of it as because we get so much pleasure from doing the work that we simply want to get back to doing, doing the work. And it's basically um, the emotions can cause us to fall into the old fight, flight, you know, freezer or, or surrender mode that is so human. Um, uh, or forget what we're going to say, or freeze up, or whatever. So, and fears that I remember myself and hear about all the time. I don't have enough experience. Uh, everyone in class is better than I am. Uh, my portfolio isn't good enough. I haven't been doing this long enough. Whatever. Um, and we all have we all have those fears. So. What can I do to reduce my anxiety? Well, my favorite trick was before a major negotiation, I would go to the men's room and I'm talking 30 minutes ahead of time. I would go to the men's room. I would go into a stall. I would shut the door. I would sit down and I would literally make notes of what, my, what I thought of as my most significant previous successes. So it might have been projects that I felt particularly good about or clients that I had negotiated deals with that I felt particularly were particularly successful or creative solutions that I played some role on the team that I felt particularly good about. I would make these notes. And I've later learned that basically what I was doing was I was preloading my frontal lobe with feelings of success um, so that when I went into the room to negotiate the deal, I felt good about myself and who I was rather than feeling anxious about not being able to get what I was, what I thought I was gonna ask for. So, and, and later when I would look at my, my night drawer, you know, the drawer next to my bed, I would find these lists and the lists had all the same things on them. So it wasn't like I was creating a new list each time. It was that I was, um, I was literally reminding myself of successes so I could feel good about myself when I was in that stressful environment. And then I, the other thing I learned is that most of us creatives um, began our professional careers when we were very young. Um, Jim Copacino, I asked him once, um, I was gonna have him be a guest on, a, on a, a gig I was doing with Creative Live. And I asked him when we were having coffee beforehand, I asked him when he thought he, he knew that he was gonna be a, a writer. And he said, it was when my mother took me to the library. The experience of going to the library and getting the books, and we did this every week, and then we would pile the books on the front seat of the car between us. And he said, I can still see my mother in the driver's seat and the pile of books and that feeling of uh, 
of, I don't know, goodness or um, being at home, being comfortable um, and knowing all those treasures that I was gonna find in those books. He said, that's when I knew. He was like seven years old when that happened. Um, and so basically Jim Copacino, who just retired, I think, started his career when he was seven years old. So when he was doing interviews for positions with ad agencies when he was in his 20s, he already had, what, 15 years of experience or something like that under his belt. So when we think we have no experience because we're young, actually, we've been practicing our craft from the beginning. Sarah Marks was an, is a photographer. I think she's now working for Amazon. Uh, she attended a class that I did uh, at Seattle Central Community College. And she told me the story of being given a camera when she was like four years old and her father promised her that he would develop the film. Father was an amateur photographer. And uh, so she took all these pictures of the camera. And of course she opened the camera back because she was curious about what was inside the camera and, um, and then gave it to her father. And then he developed the film faithfully and gave it to her. And the film all had all these beautiful all of these beautiful stripes of light on the film, not the pictures she took, but the, and she loved it. She loved it. So she saved those pictures. And in fact, um, she showed those pictures to me and I used them in a, in a thing I did. So she began her career at four years old. And, and that, that story um, I've heard over and over again from people who are creative. So when we think we have no experience, we started really, really young. And I think it's really important to remember that they can't get whoever they is, the client that's interviewing you for a gig or the job inside a big corporation or a small one, they can't get what you do, the way you do it from anyone else but you. So basically, your individual way of practicing your craft puts you in a niche automatically. So you, that power, if you're in the room and you're negotiating with somebody, the very fact that they've asked you to the table means that you're a player in their mind and they want something that you have that they can't get from anybody else. Um, get a coach. Um, you don't even, you don't have to, you know, pay, you can pay a coach, you can pay somebody like me, um, or you can get a coach who's a friend or a professional who, who can act as a mentor, someone who knows the field, your area of the field, and knows it well, who has your best interests at heart, and who can talk you through while you're going through the process of negotiating. Hugely helpful. Even if you completely disagree the conversation that you have makes um, put you in a position where you think of things that you would not have thought of otherwise just through the conversation and you feel stronger because you walk through and said the words, talked about it, compared notes, argued about it. Um, so it's so it's very, very valuable to talk to someone during the process while you're doing it. And then, and these are my tips for reducing anxiety. Think of negotiation as research. That was a huge help for me. Um, when I quit thinking of it as a confrontation and thought of it as a way of getting information that will help me uh, figure out how to do the project, all of a sudden it changed my whole attitude about negotiation itself. And it put me more in the learning mode. And I have now read that when we are in the learning mode, we are more acceptable to the back and forth of being corrected when we're wrong and not taking it personally. So the very mode of kind of having ourselves thinking of negotiation as a conversation and as research into what might be done where the information that you have because of your background experience 
combined with information that your client or your prospective employer has and their background in research, when you combine those two, you can come together with something that you would not have come up with on your own. So the very process of negotiation as an information gathering uh, process is uh, a really good way to think about it. And then finally on these tips is, I used to say, sit on the same side of the table. Now we don't do that while we have COVID, but the same thing is true. The problem with facing the other person is that it automatically puts us into kind of a conf confrontation situation. When, when we have something that we can talk about, so if we can go to screen share and we have a project or something that we're sharing with the other person that we can talk about that item together, we're in effect doing a sit on the same side of the table mode. And that helps us reduce the anxiety because now we're talking about something that we might do together rather than, uh, rather than uh, just back and forth between the two of us. Okay, getting control. How to do research to determine what you and the job you're after are worth. I just had a client, this is last week, Zoom call with a client, and he lost two of his top UX people. And they were both, he was paying both of them $125,000 a year. Both of them are kind of lower mid-career. Uh, both of them had been with him. Uh, his firm has like 60 employees. They've been with the firm for, you know, I think a, a, more than, a little more than a year. He thought he was paying them pretty well. Um, in January, they were both offered over $200,000. So this little firm uh, with its, you know, 60 person, around 60 person headcount, they they are doing uh, uh, um, e-commerce sites for mid-sized corporations. And what's happening is that the uh, mega corporations, the Adobe's, the, uh, uh, the Apple's, the Microsoft's, the Facebook's, et cetera, are gobbling up all the UX people and these small, the small firms are losing talent and are unable to raise, they couldn't afford to pay their UX staff uh, $200,000 a year. So it's a real crisis for them. They're gonna to have to find a way to uh, negotiate better deals with their clients if they're going to be able to compete with, with the uh, stealing of their talent. Um, and so then I did a little bit of, uh, a little bit of touching the waters with some of my other clients. And I found that, that uh, Google, Microsoft and Facebook were also pulling UX people out of these, out of these firms, especially in the area of, of uh, user experience in the e-commerce environment. So, um, and there's probably other parts of user experience. So that's great, great for you as a UX candidate. Um, so how do you know the range? Well, by being in, co in contact with people who, um, who are on the front lines of that, um, through your professional association, uh, um, Design Week, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Design Week, it's a London-based publication that uh, sends out an email every day. Um, and I've been following it for years and they just ran a whole series on the subject of, of of uh, raises in salaries in 2000, uh, in, in 2021, and all the categories were up by 30 or 40 percent. So it was it was pretty remarkable. And we haven't seen that for a long time. So that uh, designer salaries had not increased from 1990 until like uh, 2019. Basically, designers overall were paid like sixty thousand dollars, and now all of a sudden we're getting this big bump. So that's a that's a huge that's a huge um, a huge change. So be be watching the salary surveys. Uh, uh, AIJ does one. 
Aquient does one, and there's a whole bunch of others out there. So be watching, be watching those, and 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 join those professional groups that that give you insights into into salaries, and then develop your own community of people who are working in the field um, and that have a little bit more experience than you do, so that you can get input from people who are who are kind of like one step above you career-wise. That was always a huge help for me early in my career. So nothing's changed. The, the human stuff, the technology changes, but the human stuff basically doesn't change. All right. Uh, so getting getting feedback from the professional community and where you can get it. Uh, basically, when I look back on my career, I see that I, I matured through all those early jobs. I mean, we were talking before we began about working in a stat house, uh, uh, doing you know basic chores for some of the more successful people in the in the industry in Seattle, um, and it took me out of school. I mean, this is not true right now, but out of school in that time, it took me a couple of years to find a job where I was really doing what I dreamed of doing when I was in school, and once I was there, then I was kind of launched where I had contact with clients and, and you know, uh, input on what was happening currently and how I could advance my career. So, but it took me a couple years and I, I um, you know, I, I worked in a direct mail house called Dinner and Quine. I worked in a stat house. I worked freelance for Dick Brown. I worked for a small, couple small design firms. And through that, I kind of got what my strengths and weaknesses were. Um, I was always a hard worker. Um, I was, you know, I'd, I'd worked from very early in my life, so I was always very diligent. That was always an asset for me. Um, and as long as I didn't kind of, and my weakness was, you know, basically if I could, if I fell into my orphan syndrome <laughs> where my vulnerabilities all were, well then, that was where bad things happened. So I became more aware of my strengths and weaknesses. And when I began studying much later negotiation, I began to realize what happens when you're negotiation, when you're preparing for a negotiation, is that your vulnerabilities all become kind of available and your anxieties raise simply because you're vulnerable in this negotiation and not perhaps going to get what you think you're going to get or you might not get the job or whatever. So your anxieties are high. Um, Larry put this in his outline, the most important, um, so fear of authority, I didn't know how to collaborate, short attention span, et cetera, I had all those things. Uh, most important negotiation tactic is shutting up. Um, <laughs> when we are nervous, we, this is human being, all humans, we all default to this. When we're nervous, nervous, we talk too much. I think it's because when we were hunter-gatherers or 300,000 years ago, uh, we, when we learned how to talk or whenever that was very early on, we found that by talking, people might not kill us. So we developed this technique of when we were nervous um, about whether or not we were going to survive, we began talking. And so our default as humans today is we're nervous and we talk too much. So, so the most important tactic is, is uh, reminding yourself to uh, ask and not tell. That's the little thing, the little thing in the back of my head when I'm negotiating is I try to remember, Ted, remember to ask questions and not talk too much. Ask, don't tell. Um, and the best technique that I have found to keep myself from talking too much is have a prepared list of questions for the negotiation session. The questions give, and I have them written down and I have them uh, visible to, my, to me, and I use the questions to get the other person talking. And by getting the other person talking, they then feel smart and engaged and I don't have to talk too much. And they think I'm smarter because they get to talk more and I get to listen and smile and agree. And, um, uh, and so having a list of questions and making the questions about the, 
the item that you're negotiating. Maybe it's a gig, freelance gig, or maybe it's a position, but make the questions larger than that. For instance, um, uh, how does, you know, the position that you're filling, how will it help fit the overall corporate strategy? I see that you're planning to make these moves. Your website, um, your, the latest press releases talk about these new products and new services. Um, uh, how, how will the hiring of me help support that larger issue? Or why is this position available now? Or why are you doing this particular project right now? What is the context that's driving this position? Um, the lar the, making the questions be about the organization and where the organization is going and why will show that you're interested in the larger issue. It'll show that you have an understanding of their goals and what they're trying to do, not because you're telling them what to do, but by asking them questions about where they're going and why they're doing that. And it, it um, and best of all, it gets the other person talking. One of the things that creatives do that, that make the mistake often is of limiting the questions to the, the precise subject at hand, like the job itself or the, or the uh, uh, design gig itself. And making the questions larger than that actually opens up the possibilities to uh, larger, <clears throat> uh, larger possibilities. Okay, so ask, don't tell. Okay, mutuality is the goal. Mutuality and conversation invites exploration of the joint possibilities. So really what we wanna have happen in this negotiation is have a conversation. Um, and if you're uh, feeling uncertain or ner extremely nervous, you can actually ask the other person to help you in the negotiation. Um, and somebody did this to me once when I was negotiating some position uh, at the Lenhart Group. The person said to me, with a woman actually, she said to me, you have more experience in negotiations like this than I do. I'm a bit nervous. Could you help me out? That was brilliant because it immediately put me on her side, wanting it to go well for her and have her leave the meeting feeling good about herself, whether she got the job or didn't get the job. And, um, and so I said, sure. So here's what I'd like, like to do here. And I helped her out with the negotiation. So it put me basically to become a coach even with, of her, even though basically I was the hiring HR person in effect. Um, or you can say, uh, my research shows positions like this are be paid between X and Y. My experience indicates that I should be at the higher end. How do you suggest we proceed? That's a very nice way of asking for the top of the range. My experience shows positions like this are paid between X and Y. My experience indicates that I should be at the higher end. How would you suggest, suggest that we proceed? So that's interjecting a little bit of mutuality into the back and forth. So what we're looking for is collaboration and conversation, not confrontation. Uh, I love to ask, help me understand. It's a standard reporter's way of framing it. Help me understand how this project is going to go forward. How does filling this position help you achieve your overall strategy and goals? I'm not sure this position is a good fit for me. Can you tell me a bit more about your strategy? Taking on this project means I'll have to learn your virtual reality program. Would your company be willing to help me with that? I'm flattered with your interest in me and your offer. Thank you so much. Would it be all right 
if I think about it overnight. Always think about all offers overnight. They're way too important to just say yes on the spot. Ask for something. Um, I once asked for a, an extension cord and got $75,000 instead of $25,000. I'll tell you a little story. We're competing for a branding assignment and it was a big one for a, for a Fortune 100 global company. And us and our competitors were all invited to the corporate headquarters of this company. Um, and we all flew to their city and we all stayed in the same hotel and uh, we all showed up at the appointed hour on the day of the interview. And, uh, and this was all an attempt to make us nervous, to make us feel less powerful than the client. And we were all put in the same waiting room well, they interviewed each one of us one after another. Um, and you know, you're sitting in this in this waiting room and you think everybody else is smarter than you are and better dressed and better looking and more prepared, and, you know, et cetera. And they're of course doing that to make you feel insecure and vulnerable. We go into the room to make the presentation and we were the last, which was a good thing. Always be last if you can be, because the client always learns from the previous presenters. And so that helps them, um, uh, it kind of helps them shape what they're expecting. And they will remember you more because you're last. And uh, we're, we arrive in the room and of course we prepared a, a little film and a presentation and we brought all the gear to show this and there was no electricity in the room. And it was one of those rooms that was a, you know, a, a giant room that had been put together with, with these movable walls. So there was no actual outlet in the small room where we were meeting with this client. And I think there were four of us and there were like 12 or 15 on the client side. So there's like a big group and then us. And the guy that was our client contact said, oh, well, just do it on your laptop. Um, that's what everyone else did. And I thought, we've gone to all this trouble, we've flown all this way, we've put all this money into this thing. Um, I'm not gonna do that. And I said, couldn't we just get somebody to get us an electrical, you know, an extension cord? Um, doesn't like, you know, the janitorial service or somebody have access, we could just snake it down the hall. And then we could, we put a lot of effort into this. I think it would be way better for you and for us, obviously, if you saw it in the way it was intended to be shown. And they agreed. So we waited and fiddled our thumbs for like 15 or 20 minutes while the power cord came and they plugged it in and we talked about the weather and our children and where we went to school and you know our various design interests, et cetera. And uh, we plugged in our thing and we did our, did our show and uh, and then they, um, we went home from that. And then the next day they called us and told us that we were a finalist. And so they called us back into the room and they said, each of you three finalists, or there were four finalists, we're offering you $25,000 to do a preliminary assignment so that we can choose uh, which one of you to, um, uh, to get this gig. And I thought, I don't have a chance in hell at winning this thing um, if I don't do something that catches their attention. And I said, I'm sorry, to do this, we would need $100,000. And they said, well, we can't do that because everyone else accepted the 25,000 and the meeting ended and everyone was uncomfortable and they walked us to the elevator and uh, one of my team members told me I was out of my mind and crazy and, and I thought maybe he might be right. And the next day we were getting on the airplane and they called me when we were walking down the jetway, literally. And he said, would you take 75,000? And I said, yes. 
And I knew that meant that not only we did we get more money than the others, but that we had won the major assignment as well because they had not offered that. They, they were desperate for us to stay involved in this case. So sometimes turning the tables and asking for something improves your chances of winning the game. Now, another factor there, at that time, I was extremely confident. So I couldn't have done that in my super anxious days. So it's, it's even today, if I'm anxious, I would be unable to ask for that. But that, at that point in time, I was feeling particularly confident because we had had a lot of successes. So, and as far as I can tell, you can't fake confidence. So, you know, when you're feeling strong, use it. <laughs> when you're feeling weak, do every trick that you can do to make yourself feel stronger. You know, do the list, do the coach, do the preparation, do all of those things. But when you're feeling strong, you don't have to do all those things. You can just ask for the money and not worry about it. So, and as I said, the other point I always wanna leave people with is um, I still have those feelings of anxiousness today that I've always had. Some days when I'm negotiating, helping a client negotiate, or a client is having me negotiate with them about whether or not I'm gonna work with them as a consultant, I, I will feel super anxious on some days, you know, whatever. So it's, I don't always feel strong. Uh, I think I said this earlier, when some, someone asks you what you were paid in your last position, I always say, do not, do not reveal what your past salary was. And my favorite line is my past salary is a private matter between my employer and myself. My past salary is a private matter between my employer and myself. You can't do that in the UK because you're, what you're paid is public. So they know what you're paid in the UK, but in the United States, they don't. So don't tell them. Um, sometimes we're asked to reduce our fees. I was asked to reduce my fees many times. Sometimes I would reduce my fees. Um, then I learned that you can say something like um, lowering my fees, lowering my fees for you would not be fair to my clients who do pay my fees in full. Lowering my fees for you would not be fair to my clients who do pay my fees in full. I love that because it actually puts a little bit of shame on the person who's asked you to lower your fees. Once I was asked, and this was a consulting gig, it was a large consulting gig after I'd left my job in London and uh, I had done it, the stupid thing of taking a overnight flight to get to this client uh, interview. And they were interviewing me to, to um, uh, help them buy design businesses. And uh, uh, so I didn't get any sleep the night before, arrived in their conference room like at nine o'clock in the morning with you know, maybe no sleep, maybe a little sleep. And then the meeting goes on all day long. They serve this turkey sandwiches in the conference room. Um, and, you know, it's the chairman, the president, the CEO of this kind of mid-sized company. And um, it was afternoon, I was like exhausted. And the chairman looks down at the table at me and he says, why do you want so much fucking money? I, that's never, had never happened to me before. No one had ever said something like that to me before. Why do you want so much fucking money? And I, feelings are really important here. I was feeling strong and I simply said, respect. That's all I said. And then I was quiet. And then everybody looks at him 
and everybody looks at me and everybody looks at him and the and the senior uh, VP of finance says, I think we found our guy. <laughs> and I get the gig. And, and what I was thinking and didn't say, and I'm glad that I didn't say it, was respect for my skills, respect for my experience, respect for what I've accomplished for others and for what I'll accomplish for you. I didn't say those things. I could have said those things, but that's what I was thinking. Again, that's in my outline, so I'll put it in the chat. Classic negotiation rules of thumb. There's all kinds of research on this. The more, the, the, the more you ask for, the more you get. It's really simple. It's called anchoring high. We human beings have a cognitive default that the first number that is mentioned in a negotiation, we all circle around that number in effect. It's called the anchoring cognitive default. If you anchor low, you're not going to get very much. If you anchor high, you will get close to what you ask, closer to what you ask for. You always get close to what that first number is. Tons of research, Harvard Negotiation Project, which was where my training came from, um, did a ton of research on this. So you always want to know what the range is and you want to ask for the top of the range or if you're feeling strong, more than the top of the range. And the reason is that you will get closer to the top of the range if you ask for more than the top of the range. So you can bet that the other party knows what the range is too. So, and of course they will tell you sometimes that the range is less than the range that you come up with. Um, and all you have to say is that, well, my research and Aquin and AIJA and uh, the Sydney, newspaper and the London Times and whatever range is this much. So, um, so you can substantiate your range. Um, and then finally, on this classic rules of thumb is never go into a negotiation without knowing what your bottom line is. So always set a bottom line in mind for yourself. And the reason that you do this is you can always change it. But what happens is when we're in a negotiation, one of the back and forth things that happens is that the conversation, sometimes we just kind of naturally lower the amount that we're willing to accept because it feels good to us. We kind of you know, want to kind of not disrupt anything. We want everybody to be kind of copacetic and happy and feeling comfortable. And so we kind of get drawn into lowering what we're willing to ask for. It's just kind of a natural thing. If you have set a bottom line in your head, my bottom line is $10,000, my bottom line is a million dollars, whatever it is, doesn't matter what the number is. If you set what the bottom line is, then a little alarm bell goes off in your head. You go, oh, I did set that as my bottom line. Then you can decide. It'll kind of force you cognitively to decide that whether you're uh, willing to, to uh, go beyond your bottom line or not. So one of my rules of thumb, know your bottom line. Uh, the difference between Asking for a starting salary versus a raise. This was in Larry's original outline. It's a great question. Well, first of all, they love you the most at the beginning of a relationship. It's all downhill from there. That's been my experience in love and in business negotiation. They think you're fabulous at the beginning, and then they find out that you know you snore or that you're a jerk or whatever. So um, they love you the most at the beginning. So you have more opportunity to get the most at the beginning than any time in the relationship. 
the biggest increases, lots of research on this, the biggest re increases in your career in salary are always when you change jobs because once you're employed, they plug you into the system, you, they tell you you're a G3 and you can only go up to this amount because that would be a G4 or there'd be some other matrix or some other corporate bullshit or government nonsense that has to do with keeping us all in this lowly paid. So once you're in the caught in their grid, they will not, they, they're not gonna break out of that. But when they're negotiating with you, then you have an opportunity to, to ask for the most money. So that's the time to ask. And all kinds of research shows that during the course of our careers, um, if we don't ask at all, we may make hundreds of thousands less over the course of our career if we don't ask for a raise. And the place to ask for the more money is always when you're changing jobs or getting that first job. And once they have you, they know that it's more difficult for you to change jobs than it is just to accept something less than what you're asking for. So they, they feel, the corporation feels like they have leverage on you and they really do because it is more difficult to change jobs than it is to get a brand new job. Um, always remember that the salary is just a part of your, con your, your compensation uh, process. And often salaries are locked, but other things aren't. Um, and sometimes when the salary is locked or the person that you're dealing with, uh, it has a fixed lock on your salary and you can't get around them for whatever reason, you can ask for maybe a signing bonus or you can ask for moving expenses or you can ask for childcare help or you can have ask for help with with other training, or you can ask for stock options, or you can ask for childcare benefits, or maybe to work from home, or schedule uh, flexibility, or better medical. So you can make a list of things that you could ask for that are beyond salary that the, that the person you're negotiating with might be able to be more flexible. Oddly, signing bonuses are very common. Um, and it's a, you know, a strange thing that you negotiate a salary of $150,000 and then they're willing to give you a signing bonus of $25,000 on top of that. Um, I guess it's because it's a one-time thing and they don't feel like they're locked into that 25,000 for the next, the second year or whatever. But it's, it's always struck me as odd, but the reality is that I've had lots of clients that have negotiated signing bonuses. So, so it's very common. My biggest fear is that I will seem greedy or inappropriate if I ask for too much, that, or if I ask for too much, they will rescind the offer. My biggest fear is I will seem greedy or inappropriate, or that if I ask for too much, they might just take away the job. Now I've gotten that comment from uh, uh, a couple of my uh, college classes that I, and junior college classes that I do, they give me feedback afterwards, or they give me uh, uh, things ahead of time, like what are you worried about with negotiations and stuff. This one's come up over and over and over again. This this fear that I will seem greedy or inappropriate. Um, and if you do your research, you'll know that you're not being greedy or inappropriate. You'll know that what you're asking for is right in the ballpark or at the top of the ballpark at the very least, or with my recommendation above the top of the ballpark and that there is documentation that shows that you're not being greedy. Um, and as I, as I said, in the 20 plus years that I've been doing negotiation consulting, only once have I run into a situation where somebody actually took the job away. Um, so negotiation is expected and I would say even appreciated in salary negotiations. And why would it be appreciated? It's because employers want people who, who are comfortable talking about difficult subjects. And salary negotiation is a classic difficult subject. It's an emotional subject. 
And mature people are able to talk about difficult subjects. And that's a huge plus to, um, to the employer is that, is that maturity. So if you're comfortable negotiating, oh, wow, well, they're a grown up. And by the way, they'll probably, if they're in a position to negotiate a gig for me or a, a supplier's salary or a whatever a purchase or something, um, they'll do that for me as well. And they've just shown that they have the skills to do that. So people who are well-researched and negotiate in a calm, collected manner are respected because they show the ability to have a difficult conversation, a sign of maturity. Forces beyond us. I mentioned this before, the global giants are hiring large numbers of UX, UI people right now, product designers, creative writers. Um, the, the game industry is going like creative. The amount of, uh, I've had like four or five uh, game people that I've helped negotiate gigs recently. Um, uh, filmmakers, even, even the old advertising industry is hiring. I mean, there's all this talk about the traditional ad industry being dead, but it's important to remember that it's still a multi-billion dollar industry and there's lots of people making good money in that industry. And I'm helping a guy right now uh, negotiate with one of those grand old agencies and they're, they're offering serious money. So, so even those traditional agencies and the holding companies of those traditional agencies, although they're not showing a lot of growth, they are paying good money to top, to top people. Um, Again, small creative consultancies sadly are losing talent to the giants because they can't pay the kind of premiums that the giants can pay. Um, corporate decisions these days, and this has been going on for a long time now, are just very data-driven, all started with Walmart, uh, basically destroying Sears. Creators and shapers of digital interfaces and digital experiences make the tools and the experiences that the decision-making data comes from, hence the demand. So this demand for UI UX right now that's so hot is because the, the data actually comes from people making decisions, buy, don't buy, decide, don't decide, change your mind, don't change your mind from creative interfaces that, that are the, the reality of the online world these days. So major brands, are desperate to be relevant online with their products and their services. And of course, you know, as consumers, we all see how bad they are at, at fumbling around with their interfaces. So you can see why the demand, and they're all terrified that they're gonna get left behind, hence this hot area. And uh, I told you about the design week. Somebody have a question? I have a question. Yeah. And the question is, will we have time for questions? Because we oh. have about 15 minutes to go here. Okay, let's do questions. I could stop and we can do questions. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, well, I did mean to interrupt you, but I, I know you were kind of on a roll there, so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the point you want to make, I'd go ahead and make it. <laughs> uh, so here's what the London-based Design Week Acquiant surveys showed just like a couple of days ago, maybe it was on Friday. Salaries for senior art directors rose 21%. This is last year. Uh, Senior digital designers increased 44%. Senior 3D animators up 30%. Increases for midway three 3D roles up 28%. UX designers saw a 33% increase in salaries. Salaries for senior UX designers up 50%. Uh, top UX designers up 70% in over the last five years since 2016. So that's 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 in the UK. Now, my guess is it's the same thing's true here and in Europe as well. So, um, and probably China, I suppose. Um, so, good times for you guys. <laughs> Get the money. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, I was wondering in regards to um, negotiating when you're a woman versus a man, yeah. Like, how much of an issue is that in tech these days? Like, is there still a differential? If so, do you have any tips? 
Well, the tip, the tip is they need you. So ask for the money. The, big, the, the research shows that women typically don't ask. So that, you know, but there's been so much publicity about tech desperately trying to get women these days that my guess is that's changed. I mean, that in the here and now that's changed. I mean, with these kind of salary upreaches, my guess is there isn't that old gender bullshit because they need good talent, period. So, you know, in a world where you're raising uh, top UX designers up 70% over the last five years, I mean, offering the woman two or 3% less, you know, <laughs> seems like what? 70%, two, three, or, you know, give me a break. So. I would just be, I'd be really confident these days to ask for a lot, ask for a lot. They can, they can say no, so what? You can always, you know, it's, it's far easier to take less than it is. You can't, you know, once you ask for an amount, it's very hard to ask for more than that amount. But when you ask for an amount and then they won't give it to you, you can say, well, what about five grand less? No, <laughs> I mean, what the hell, you know? So, yeah, so I, that's a quick follow up. Um, if you're if you're trying to attain your first role, they know that I like what I understand. Ask for the money, but you're also like, you know, you're you're junior at best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have no experience. Yeah, uh, I think the answer the answer to that is that you've spent your whole life preparing for this moment. So. You know, the reality, <laughs> the reality, I mean, basically that's the truth. That's, that's the truth for all of this, the whole time of our life. You know, I mean, there's, there, there's this weird thing in our society from age about 30 to about 50, you're super in demand, right? So from age about 30 until about 50, when you're below 30, you're, you don't have any experience, which is bullshit. And when you're above 50, you're too fucking old, okay? <laughs> well, that's bullshit too. You know what I mean? It's like, it's very individual. There's a lot of, there's a lot of 19 year olds that can kick my ass creatively. <laughs> and you know what I mean? It's like, it's, it's, it's all really about the person, but there's this weird thing in our society and the same, and, the, and the women, it's the same issue. It's like this weird thing. Oh, well, she's, you know, she should be home in the kitchen or whatever. You know, we're past, we're, you know, makes me really angry, that kind of stuff. I mean, I, because in my firm, I paid women just as much as I paid the men. There was no difference. Thank you. Yeah. I'd like to kind of follow on to Star's question because even, even though the number of the, the demand for UX and UI designers has been on the rise for sure, it's still not easy. It's really not easy to get an entry level job, and and some of us are, have really worked okay. hard. On it. It's taken a while to succeed. Yeah. Is is there a, is there ever a point where you go like, take that entry level job? If they're saying we're paying you eighty thousand, yeah. say great, eighty thousand. Yeah, then, yeah, absolutely. And then work your increases in subsequent jobs. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean that, and that's exactly what my career was like. That's exactly what happened to me is my first job was at Boeing as an illustrator because I could kind of copy Dick Brown and, uh, and, and I just took the job and, uh, and I left in nine months and I went to the next place and I worked there just short of a year and I left, you know? So yeah, absolutely get, get in. But the thing is the, get yourself a community so you know where the jobs are, find people you can talk to Join the organization so you and go to the meetings. Ask the speakers questions. You know, I mean, I uh, a guy I helped a few years ago, uh, right out of right out of school, was desperate to work for this consulting uh, operation in Berkeley, California. Very very hot consultancy, not a design consultancy, but a you know a think tank kind of consultancy. And I said, the guy that's uh, one of the leaders there just wrote a book. Go to the book party, ask him questions, go to the signing, ask him questions, go to his next publicity gig, ask him more questions, make him think you're smart because of your questions. Get, you know, 
They, and guess what? They said, would you be interested in interviewing with the firm? Your questions, young man, are really good. Guess what? He got a job. And at first he was carrying the guy's briefcase. So what? Ultimately he ended up on a consulting gig in India uh, uh, doing research on cell phone uh, expansions for uh, Tata Industries, which is the guy that owns Jaguar. I mean, you know, it's like, so, he, in, you know, so, you know, he, 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 he basically endeared himself to this guy who had written a book by asking questions. That's all he did. And he went to like two or three of these book parties, followed him around. And he looked like a hungry dog, I guess. And it worked. And there was nothing brilliant about him. He was just a guy with him, you know, some ambition. You know, he wanted to work in this particular job. Very similar story to my New York story about the guy with the green card. He was hungry and he wanted this particular thing. So he put himself on this focused path of this one thing. And that's not for everybody. That's not the way my thing worked. I just took the first job that, uh, that the director of Burnley School had an off, a deal come in from Boeing and I'd stuck my head in the office and said, I just got married and I need a job. <laughs> And, and he sent me to Boeing to interview, and I got the job. And that, that you know, the, it, you know, today we have this world of online applications. I've done interviews with students who've done 200, you know, at, you know applications, and it, it's heartbreaking. Um, uh, I think that you always have to find a person. You have to find people that you can talk to, people that can connect you, people that can help you. And then after the fact, they send you to the online thing and you fill out the online form. But you only do that when you already have an in. So you're, you know, you have industry associations, you have mentors, you have people who are a little bit ahead of you, friends, colleagues that graduated from the previous class, all those things give you opportunities. And then of course, it's about when I was in Burnley, one of my one of my uh, uh, fellow students, who I was very jealous of at the time, he was more sophisticated than I was. So he went to the biggest ad agency and uh, asked the creative director out for drinks. Well, I was I would have been terrified to do that. There's no way in hell I would have had the confidence to do that. And guess what? He got a job as a junior art director at Colin Weber, which was the biggest agency on the West Coast at the time. Um, but I didn't have the confidence to do that. Boeing was perfect for me. It was great. Got to be in a group of people who had similar skills to mine, some of them were older. They had, so I could see kind of how people's careers had advanced. And I quickly realized it wasn't a good place for me, but I found another place. So. And so I don't think none of that human stuff has ever changed. The technologies change, but the human stuff doesn't change. We have uh, 300,000 years of developing these weird personalities that we have, and I don't think they've changed since we've been herding reindeer or whatever. I did it. I talked while muted. Uh, anyone else have a question for Ted before we uh, send him off? Okay. I think you were the person that just gave advice about be sure to ask a lot of questions. So I did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, and not to, not to uh, uh, <laughs> really drive this one too far into an unintended place, but uh, I, I've, I've given the advice in the past that the best interview you can have is one where you say nothing. Yes. And the, <laughs> right. And the interviewer does all the talking because you've, you've asked just one great question after another who doesn't yeah. love to talk about themselves yeah and at the end of it they go away going like man that was great i sure yeah. like talking to ted he was awesome because i got to do all the talking yeah so, uh, have have your questions ready and uh they will they they kind of never fails to produce a better experience that's me that's my point of view well, we thank you, Ted. You're welcome. Uh, I was gonna I'm, put this, I'm only just was, a little concerned, of course, that you know, 
Mariette, Michaela, and Emily are listening to all this, and now they're going to, you know, come pound on me. But <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, I'll just send you all to talk to Ted directly. Yeah, good. Uh, but thanks so much. This has really been great, and we we absolutely appreciate your your expertise in this area. I put I put a link to your website. Uh, into the right. chat early on. And I think you have something you want to put in there for us before we leave. Yeah, I'm trying to find that. Let me find my file. Here. Um, uh, let's see, there's the file. Okay. And there's the item in the file. And I can just drag and drop it into the uh, chat thing if I remember this. Does that work? I don't know if you can drag and drop, honestly. Really? I think, well, try it. It's there, 30 kilobytes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's my outline. I noticed there's some typos, so I'm sorry about that. Is anybody seeing that? Because I'm not. I haven't seen anything yet, no. I think no. Uh, beyond a, a certain size, uh, Zoom might not be able to accept it. 30 kilobytes is pretty small, isn't it? Really small. Yeah. <laughs> so Ted. actually, um, I think it went to me directly. It didn't go to the group. Oh. Oh, 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 I see it did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So You're special star. <laughs> oh, I see. Well, we know that Larry. <laughs> so everyone in meeting, I see. So that's what I need to do. I'm going to do that now. Everyone in meeting. Yep. And everyone, there in, was meeting. everyone in meeting. Good. Thanks you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So those things to say, by the way, um, uh, the one about, uh, um, my clients, uh, not fair to my clients who do have to pay my fees for full. I have a photographer who I did some negotiation training with who thanks me every six months or <laughs> every once in a while he calls, he sends me a note and says, thank you for that phrase. He uses it all the time. Um, and it's been a huge help to him. <laughs> so anyway, all right. Right. Awesome. Thank you thank all. You. Thanks, Ted. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ted. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.